Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the fifth installment of the spring 2021 lecture series. I would like to welcome our guests and lecturers this evening, Leslie Locke and Sasha Zivkovich, co-founders of and co-principals of the Ithaca-based award-winning design firm, Hannah Office. This series has been planned, organized, and hosted by the student lecture committee comprised of Leland Young, Arya Hill, Emma Sweeten, Tim Cox, Connor Leidner, Uh, Benjamin Sturkey, Jake Swartz, uh, Keith Hack, Gates Breeden, Connor Brown, and myself, your host this evening, uh, Matias Montenegro Sandoval. A quick reminder that this lecture is being recorded for the school's distributive purposes. Um, I'd like to refresh everyone on how to ask questions. Feel free to submit your questions as they come. And at the end of the lecture, uh, we'll also have time for more discussion. If you would like to ask your question anonymously, you can submit your questions privately to me or any other member of the committee. Um, additionally, you can use the raise your hand function and I will be more than happy to call on you to ask your question. At that point, you can turn on your camera and your microphone and personally ask Leslie and Sasha your questions. Okay, so Hannah Office is an experimental design and research studio based in Ithaca, New York, led by co-principals Leslie Locke and Sasha Zivkovich. Their work ranges in scale from furniture to the urban and aims to rethink and advance typical construction processes and their relationship to technological means and architectural results. The procedural foci of digital design and fabrication technologies explore material intelligence, the affordances of contemporary tools, sustainability, and the economics within practice. Hannah Office's works have resulted in them being awarded to the being awarded the 2018 Folly Function Competition by the Architectural League of New York and Socrates Sculpture Park, named Next Progressives in 2018 by Architect Magazine awarded an AXA Faculty Design Award honorable mention in 2020 and winning the 2020 Architectural League Prize. Leslie Locke is currently an assistant professor at Cornell University College of Architecture, Art and Planning and directs Cornell's Urban Construction Laboratory, which aims to develop alternate housing typologies and urbanization models through the implementation of novel material methods, new processes of construction and robotic mass customization. Sasha Zivkovich is also an assistant professor at Cornell University AAP, where he directs the Robotic Construction Laboratory, an interdisciplinary research group that develops and implements novel ro robotic construction technology by integrating cutting edge materiality, fabrication, structure, and sustainability. Without further ado, it is with my great pleasure that we welcome professors Leslie Locke and Sasha Zivkovich. Thank, Thank you, you. Matthias. Um, so we'll share screen. Okay, can you see our screen? <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Matthias, for the kind introduction. And also thank you very much to the student lecture committee for the invitation to share our work with the School of Architecture and Design community at Virginia Tech tonight. Um, we do think that the topic of crisis uh, as framed by the lecture series uh, indeed presents a chance for opportunity and for reflection. And we think that there are certain concerns that drive our work, architectural, environmental, and technological. And today, this evening, we would like to take the concept of form and making to unpack some of these concerns and their conceptual entanglements. The title of our lecture tonight is Making Form Work. Um, but maybe we have to ask the question, what makes form work? We believe that issues of making and forming are fundamental to how we operate as HANA. The various projects presented in this lecture seek to inform form through a variety of methods and production, um, synthesizing new material systems, tectonic articulations, environmental practices, technological affordances, and forms of constructions. So in the past few years, uh, we created open source construction machines, which we argue inevitably affect how we think and design through making. So in our work, we aim to mine the tension between machine means and architectural ends across scales, which influence the way we can build or perhaps ought to build in the future. And the following projects that we're sharing today are 
a work in progress, and they aim to give expression through design to some of these questions. We spent the last five years building an infrastructure and framework for architectural exploration across scales. So starting from the design of the tools, moving to prototypes and installations, and then combining all the research into the construction of a small building. And so this is also roughly the outline of the lecture today. Um, as Leslie mentioned, around 2016, we became interested in a new method of making, namely concrete 3D printing. And at that time, we had no access to a robotic arm uh, at school or any more advanced fabrication technologies at Cornell, or at least large scale fabrication technologies. And as you can see with the founding story of our research lab, um, um, a kind of privileged crisis of academic resources can become an opportunity for innovation. So in order to conduct research in advanced manufacturing and engage these new methods of making, one obviously needs to have the facilities, the means, and the tools to do such work. And so we had to become inventive and build our own machinery to do the type of research that we wanted to do back at the time. On the left here in this image, you can see the 3D printer that Leslie and I built in 2011, one of the original rep reps. Um, and on the right, you see the printer that RCL developed at Cornell in 2016. And they're based essentially on, on the same uh, open source uh, framework. The printer that we developed is fully open source and runs off an Arduino board with slightly modified firmware. And if you're interested in making one of these printers, a 3D model, parts list, and wiring diagram can be downloaded on our lab website. We do think that fully unpacking the manufacturing tool or machine is an exciting opportunity for architects to reclaim authorship over processes of construction, which fundamentally influence the way we can build. And in some ways, we are all facing a crisis of manufacturing and production. The building industry is incredibly unproductive. Um, construction techniques are changing uh, very, very slowly. And we as architects can and must have agency in this process uh, for various reasons. So that's one of the kind of main drivers of our research. And while the machine is only really a framework, our conceptual thesis is that with new tools come new architectural opportunities. And so Daedalus gave us the flexibility to rethink construction through the lens of this new tool. What is important to note as a broader argument is that we also believe that new technology comes with a responsibility to make these tools uh, broadly available. This printer costs about $6,000 to make, and you see a kind of um, preliminary or simplified parts list for this printer. And this is a small, it still uh, costs money, but it's a small price tag comparing uh, it to sort of peers and considering its size and complexity. The printer itself was built over a three week period in a collaborative option studio at Cornell. Um, I taught back in 2016 and you see some of the students involved in this process. And uh, there was a kind of mentality of hacking and making that emerged uh, during the studio. And so we in fact managed to build this machine based on these smaller machines, scaling it up and uh, sort of transforming it to become essentially a construction equipment. And so after a period of material development and machine modification, our printer Daedalus is now able to print full-scale building components in foam, recycled plastic, and concrete. And for us, this new tool opens the door to novel and perhaps unfamiliar architectural speculation. And we discover in this process, we discovered that the 3D printer, a machine which has long been characterized as characterless because it can presumably print anything, is in fact the exact opposite. It has plenty of characters that what we like to call productive constraints. Most of these constraints are informed by concrete rheology and gravity, which we call the two frenemies of concrete 3D printing. Initially, our interest was in the following process, like a three-dimensional drawing, the machine horizontally deposits one line after another, and if lines are shifted through corbeling, the printer creates spatial form. So inherent in this rather simple process is the complex architectural language of concrete printing. In the project Additive Architectural Elements, our research question is, what is the architecture of 3D printed concrete? 
How can materiality and unique fabrication opportunities and constraints of the tools inform the design? So building the machine was perhaps the easy part um, with the aim to derive an architecture that is intrinsic to additive manufacturing process. We experimented with dozens of initial concrete mixture and printing failures, as you can see here in this photo, to understand the material's tolerance and this urge for imprecision. So when printing and concrete, the same rules apply as in a small desktop 3D printer but gravity takes on altogether a different role. So cantilevers have to be carefully constructed and new support material strategies have to be developed. Tool paths would have to be carefully manipulated. So in this photo, you can see here is um, we're actually um, uh, depositing the, the gravel, which is a reusable formwork as the printer prints. And so we see this manipulation of 3D printing rule sets as a tremendous opportunity. Concrete printing requires the development of entirely new architectural language, which takes into the account the limitations of the process as well as its performative advantage. And as mentioned earlier, this project aims to review the 3D printer's highly idiosyncratic architectural tectonics and narratives. And in this exploration, we chose um, several prototypical motifs, floor, column, door, window, wall, and ceiling, and began to develop strategies as to how the layering of concrete, this relentless three-dimensional drawing of extruded lines and material and the act of corbeling can suggest new strategies for building. So in the first um, element, the mushroom column, working with the constraint of gravity, um, the, the column plays of cantilever over support material by printing upside down. And the horizontal striation resulting in the structural assemblies that then seamlessly transition between the vertical and the horizontal. In a 3D printed structure, all common architectural motifs and building components must be rethought to fit the logic of layer construction. For example, um, uh, that we always use is a concrete printer cannot print in midair. So therefore, the otherwise simple task of creating a rectilinear window opening in the wall becomes a de facto impossibility. As you can see here, in this element, uh, the, the, the core bolt, uh, the window element. So rather than drastically altering the process, which is stopping the machine, you insert a beam and then printing on top of the beam, we consider the shortcoming as an opportunity for design. So one logical consequence for the window is then to cantilever incrementally and become a triangular corbelled arc window. And suddenly seemingly advanced technology relies on obsolete or archaic structural strategies such as corbelling here. In the case of the element force column, shown here, the modification of the printing direction, so printing upside down or printing in section, um, is deployed to overcome the printer de deficiencies. And printed in section, the force column hints at the potential to deposit material where structurally necessary. Smart poche wall, um, similar to the force column, explores the manipulation of the concrete density to optimize for structural performance. And it tests how optimized structural performance might begin to be architecturally expressed in the wall assembly. The potential for excessive ornamentation is brought up in the doornament. Uh, we certainly like to have fun um, with the names. Uh, and the full-scale prototype, we were playing with the delamination of layers to create screen-like moments of transparency. Ornamentation can also occur horizontally, likewise, and the floornament, besides patterning, the floor domain could be structurally and algorithmically optimized to accommodate varying uh, you know, floor loads. And so 3D printing also opens a possibility for an integration of building systems and furniture. In this element, the ceiling uh, is an expressive play on ducts for ventilation, um, reflectors for lighting, and it becomes a type of performative poche for building system. And so what you see in this photo, um, the sort of 
undulation would be the articulation of the ceiling that we see. There are certainly multiple narratives at play in this project, and we chose to present the work with a particular speculative focus. And we can also discuss the work in various other terms as well. From a technical point of view, there are multiple advantages to 3D printing. For example, all the elements, geometries were constructed without the use of formwork. And this constitutes a paradigm shift for concrete construction, which allows for radical mass customization of buildings and building components. There's also great potential for material savings because the 3D printer can deposit material where structurally necessary, uh, an enormous advantage and path towards smarter construction. However, there are severe shortcomings to working with concrete. The cementitious material itself has to change and become drastically more sustainable for 3D printing to become a viable future technology. So while our concrete projects explore the design benefits of 3D printing, we as designers have a responsibility to dig deeper and constantly challenge the materials we work with. In the future, we aim to replace concrete with more sustainable alternatives. And this is something that we are actively working on in our research labs with colleagues uh, at Cornell Engineering. Um, and following our initial test in the full-scale 3D printing of the elements, we investigated how additive architecture elements can be scaled up and perhaps deployed in the building context. So in this um, speculative uh, design project, the Fabricate Lilong project explores the potential of computational protocols, in this case, 3D printing, at the architectural scale as a speculative housing design at the urban scale. And the smart pochet wall that you saw earlier is expanded in this context of multi-unit housing. It can be densified for structural load, thickened to become a party wall, and attenuated to meet the thinness of glazing transitions. And also the core window um, is uh, explored here as both window and entrance opening at the housing scale. The ceiling element can inform individual modules or organized into a cross-modular section with mechanical connections across multiple units in the cluster. And the force column element is transformed into an integrated wall and beam system, which acts both a structural structure and a screen. Um, looking at the housing design um, from the, the sort of building and structure scale um, to the cluster scale, the smart pochet walls are mass customized to address different domestic functions and expand into thick, thickened cores for utilities and circulations. The 3D printed cluster modules can be also organized into continuous row houses, creating an urban fabric that operates both in section and in plan. In this investigation, apart from the typological transformation of the housing, um, the original spine organization of a linear semi-public space is transformed into a weaving network of semi-public alleys and courtyard spaces. We think that designing with additive architecture elements at the housing scale can offer alternate inspirations to build our city fabric and perhaps offer solutions to address a crisis on housing and housing construction. And this research is currently ongoing in our office and our long-term long -term goal is to make housing more customizable, spatially diverse and economically accessible. It's going to be a long journey, but we are currently working on residential projects in Houston, Texas, which will advance some of this research and will be constructed over the summer and the fall of this year. So at HANA, we try to test our ideas across scales, and we're quite interested to see how certain intellectual frameworks change and transform when translating from one scale to another. So the idea of robotic mass customization inspired our Rolling Stones project, uh, which, um, as Matthias has mentioned at the introduction, is the winning design for the Folly Function uh, 2018 competition by the Architectural League of New York and Socrates Sculpture Park. 
The design is deeply informed by program as well, which in this case is public seating. And the competition brief called for a design that would be movable by visitors and staff, but solid enough that visitors are discouraged from removing it from the park. And so with concrete gravity working in our favor this time around, uh, we had the second part covered from the get-go. So we knew that we wanted to design um, concrete furniture because it partially fits uh, these descriptions. Now, leveraging movement architecturally and as folly itself, the design is quite playful and encourages creative interaction and allows park visitors to essentially discover a variety of seating configurations while moving the seats across the lawn. And so responding to scales within the public park landscape, the Rolling Stones can form a long continuous bench object like what you see here in the photograph. And uh, they can aggregate into smaller benches or disperse entirely to form different size seating groups or solitary compositions. So each seat is different in scale, color, and geometry. And the act of rolling adds additional complexity because it allows for a variety of chair configurations. And some of these chair configurations encourage a more upright seating positions while others animate for lounging and relaxation. So overall in this project, uh, 3D printing with concrete enables us to create these 25 affordable and self-similar, but ultimately entirely individual seats. So no longer bound to the relentless paradigm of standardization, 3D printing opens the possibility for design freedom, customization, and individuality. Um, as is perhaps evident in this photo, uh, concrete is indeed hard to steal or roll. Uh, and there are certainly some improvements that can be made about the rollability of these, of these chairs. Um, and so while these sectional pro profiles reference archetypes of chairs, seats, and lounge chairs, uh, the layered fabrication process that you get from the concrete creates actually quite a comfortable and textured uh, seating surface. The material that we used in the 3D printing process um, in this project, but also in others, is a Portland cement-based mortar, which is then reinforced with nylon fibers, resulting in a strong concrete assembly. And in addition, each seat is supported by three steel rebar profiles, which you can see in the sort of exploded axon on the left, which is embedded in a double layer of concrete. And so to enable the creation of their cantilevered forms, the seat's interior is supported with a bed of gravel during printing, which is also something that we explored in the additive elements project, but as, as well as in the cabin. So the gravel will continue to um, join us uh, this <laughs> evening. And so the layer of gravel remains imprinted on each of the chair's interior surfaces, giving it this kind of geologic character, which is also an honest reading of the fabrication process itself. And so we want to end this project by showing this video of the making of the Rolling Stones, um, which is sort of a, a conceptual overview of the project itself and then the fabrication of the project. And so you see here the different aggregation opportunities, um, um, the linear bench objects, the clusters, um, or kind of smaller clusters. Whenever we do projects like this, we um, do a lot of testing and exploration. You see here the, the printing process and how the first layer is being put down by the printer on the sheet of plastic. Um, that's always the critical moment in each of these designs. And then you can also see that, you know, while certain parts of this process are automated, it's certainly also a collaboration between people and machines. And so for this project in particular, we did a number of reinforcement tests, testing different fibers and steel uh, assemblies uh, to ensure that these seats really work as, um, uh, as, as kind of public furniture in a park. And so we settled on this rather hefty, bulky steel reinforcement within the double layer that you can see in here in this video. Um, and so we had to fabricate all these custom um, steel rebar profiles for this. Um, so there you see the printing process. These chairs are then printed over the course of roughly a day. And uh, we have since optimized the fabrication process and are printing more of them at the same time. Here you see excavation of these modules and then 
kind of structural testing. And obviously, testing. <laughs> obviously, concrete is very good in, in compression. And it's, it's not so happy in, in tension, uh, which is why the steel is really needed um, in order to make this project feasible and, and work. And besides exploring the architecture actual potential of horizontal layer printing, we are also interested in developing new processes of manufacturing altogether. And so the sub-additive 3D printing project was done at RCL with Christopher Battaglia and Martin Miller, and it explores technological opportunities uh, to conserve resources and rethink construction. And so based on Christopher, oops, sorry. Based on Chris Battaglia's MRC thesis project, we developed a spatial method of concrete 3D printing where the concrete gets deposited on a support material, in this case, gravel. So uh, in contrast to um, horizontal layer 3D printing, sub-additive printing is a fundamental deviation from the standard process of 3D printing. Um, so it's a different deposition. Um, and so for certain complex geometries like shells, this method has uh, severe adv advantages. Um, and depositing cementitious material on a, on a supportive aggregate is not a new thing. The Phillips Pavilion, for example, at the Brussels Expo in 58 was one of the first modern examples to panelize a large complex surface through landforming. And so casting on a shaped hyperbolic sand form, multiple panels were produced as sections of the surface transferred to the site and then post tension to create the structure itself. Now here's what's really smart about this technique, the subadditive technique. The same machine that prints the concrete is used to create the flexible gravel formwork. And so in a first step, the printer creates a surface that matches the curvature of the thin shell geometry that you want to print. So it's making its own formwork. You see this being done with a tennis ball end effector, uh, which, has, uh, which is a process that has since also been uh, improved. This is not the smartest way of doing this. Um, and then in a second step, the concrete material is deposited on the reusable gravel formwork, which is what you see here. This is one of the first test prints that Chris did. And so with this method, you can really rapidly print highly mass customized and optimized gridded thin shell structures. So you can change the shape of the mount, you can change the shape of the pattern, um, and you can um, dramatically optimize the, the structure. And I just want to run this video to the end because you see the excavation and the kind of uh, thinness uh, of this test. And, and so this uses very little material and is somewhat efficient. Uh, from a structural point of view. And here you see the printing process using a robot. Um, this is all still a bit messy and we have to increase speed and accuracy, which is something that we've uh, since worked on and, and written some papers about. Um, if you're interested, I'm sure you can find them and look them up. And so uh, really what this project is all about is that we use the 3D printer's flexibility um, and so we can use form finding methods and structural optimization to determine the lattice densities required at each point within the surface. And depending on the shape of the structure, we get different lattice patterns that are uh, optimized. And this reduces waste material and increases fabrication efficiency. And in our research in the lab and in the practice, we do think that it's paramount to test full-scale prototypes. So this is a mock-up of one of these sub-additive printed arches. Um, each of those components weighs roughly 150 kilograms, was printed in the span of one hour, and can be rolled up for easy assembly. And so as a new method, uh, sub-additive printing really leverages digital workflows to produce structurally, materially, and spatially optimized building components while dramatically reducing waste material or material in general. Of course, we don't only work in concrete. While it's nice to have a functioning 3D printer, we soon wonder whether this DIY hacking approach to architectural fabrication tools can be replicated to other platforms. And RCL has very limited resources, um, uh, admittedly within a highly privileged academic context, but it still means that we have to be inventive when it comes to equipment. So as it turns out, one can go to eBay and purchase a used KUKA KR200 for only $8,000. 
which is not free, but considerably cheaper than buying a new robotic arm. The robot we purchased was formerly a welding robot for GM, producing cars in the plant in Louisiana. While the machine is proprietary, it was important for us to keep the rest of the project open source and accessible for anyone. In terms of cost, it is hard to find a cheaper robot. This is a cost breakdown of the robot and the self-developed foundation system of totaling about $14,000. And as with the 3D printer, a certain amount of hacking is required to make this robot work for architectural production. And all the information how to set this up is available on the RCL website and in an Acadia paper written by the lab called Open Source Factory. For us at HANA, this robot enabled research beyond the three axes constraints of the 3D printer and is a new technol technological means to inform form and new material. And so jumping materials now, uh, LogNot uh, is the next project that we would like to talk about. And it's a project that emerged from our first initial exploration with custom wood-based tools for the robot. And as a building material, we often encounter wood in the shape of two by fours or plywood or other, other standardized dimensions. Uh, but as the diagram on the upper left shows, uh, wood or timber comes from trees that are usually non-standard. And so log knot is a method for creating complex timber curvature by cutting and reassembling tree trunks, both regular and irregular. It's a rather simple idea. So one can cut and reconstitute a log in order to bend it spatially. And you see some of these early studies, they show how log knot creates this infinite loop of round wood, which curves three-dimensionally along its length. And what we do oftentimes in the design process is that we start with uh, manual explorations and study models uh, to explore uh, joinery and, and overall assembly. And so these studies then get taken further and explored in, in a larger scale. This is an image of an early prototype which elaborates on the idea of curvature generation and also incorporates uh, sort of in the middle kind of hidden a small number of small tree forks and highly irregular wood geometries. So once assembled, the wooden components of log knot form a spatially complex figure eight knot. And in a reciprocal design process, the project fosters synergies and feedback between material, fabrication, digital form, and full-scale construction. This is a view from the top showing the completed project. You can see the figure eight knot, and uh, you see a kind of lamppost and a person that gives you a sense of scale for this project. There are a few technical things worth mentioning in the project. Lognot uses computation to optimize each joint for moment, moment forces. So while the overall shape of this knot might not be structurally optimized, uh, we are really investigating a local optimization. And each of these joints is precisely rotated to resist uh, local, local torsion. And so we use the number of structural optimized station solvers um, to analyze forces in each segment of the knot. And this information then was fed into the design of a series of physical prototypes and joinery studies. And our team went uh, through testing a whole range of joints. And you see some of these experiments here, all at full scale, uh, finger joints, mortise and tenon joints, dovetail joints, uh, as well as custom steel dowel joints. And each of these methods exhibited severe shortcomings in either structural capacity, ease of assembly, or ease of robotic fabrication. And so what we finally settled on, based on the knowledge gained from the initial joinery tests, the team then developed a custom trifold mortise and tenon joint, which is self-supportive during assembly and able to resist bending in multiple directions. So the project was designed for this assembly, which is why we used lag bolts for connections. Um, also, this is a fully permitted project. Um, so our structural engineers um, were, were a bit careful and dimensioned rather big lag bolts uh, for the final prototype, which you see in the next image. We also optimized load behavior. Um, the radius of the round wood reduces towards the apex of the knot at the top. And at ground level, where the moment forces and loads are highest, uh, the, the whole assembly thickens. 
And as you can see here, prototyping sort of occurs at, at various uh, scales and at various uh, stages uh, with our robotic platform. Um, this is a, a view of the milling process um, where we're first milling down the surface and then going in to produce the mortise and tenon cut. Um, there are other things that we like about the project. Um, the finishing cut, for example, uses the side of the bit instead of the tip, uh, further taking advantage of the robot six axis flexibility. And this is an overview of the entire process. So you see on the left indexing the log using the robot, uh, milling a surface down, uh, milling the mortise and tenon, finishing cut, and then the final cut, uh, which has a slight undercut, which means that once the mortise and tenon is secured in place, the wood geometry itself prevents the, the piece from slipping out or disconnecting uh, through this undercut. And to prevent checking and shaking, because wood is a, is a living material, the milled end grains uh, were covered in pentacryl, which is a fast acting, non-toxic, non-hygroscopic and non-oxidizing wood stabilizer. Um, and so this was a process that we had to do uh, every once in a while um, over the course of the, the fabrication, like once a day, I coat this. Um, as we said before, we're working with small budgets. This is another project that had a relatively small budget um, of $8,000 uh, for, for the construction of this sort of large pavilion. Uh, we did not have access to heavy machinery and we had to develop a, a way to um, uh, produce a self-sufficient construction method that requires only minimal formwork or support. Um, so this is, here you see how Lognaut was assembled. Uh, we had a dedicated team uh, of, of uh, helpers uh, over the course of three days. And so each uh, of these components of Lognaut is lifted in place by hand. And then through the geometry of the joint, um, it, it assembles uh, into, into the right kind of shape and curvature. And, uh, and you see here in this, uh, video that after each completed knot arch segment, the structure is then attached again to the ground or using earth anchors. And during the construction, to hold up the entire structure during construction, all that's required is really minimal formwork. You see this uh, coming up at the very top of the image. Every once in a while, we had a two by four screwed to this assembly to hold it in place as we are assembling. Uh, to conclude this project, unfamiliar notions of craftsmanship and precision, both digital and analog, emerge from Lognaut's conceptual design practice and characteristic construction technique. Lognaut was exhibited as part of Cornell's 2018 biannual called, called Duration, Passage, Persistence, Survival, and addresses this theme on multiple levels. Environmental cycles, birth, growth, and decay are intrinsic to complex forest ecosystems and processes. Conceptually and spatially, the Log Knot project references these eternal cycles and reciprocal relationships between systems, both natural and technical. The infinitely looping structure is an interplay between archaic natural geometry, advanced computation, and state-of-the-art digital fabrication. And by questioning how forests are used as a resource, Log Knot provides a critical commentary on various perpetual wood cycles, economic, environmental, and cultural in nature. The last project we want to share today is perhaps a, cumula is a culmination of all the separate research agendas that we've showed you in this lecture so far. Uh, the Ashen Cabin is a project which started in the summer of 2017, and it was finished in the summer of 2019. Informed by two material narratives, it is a small building made of 3D printed concrete and robotically fabricated timber envelope. In its first material system, Ashen Cabin explored how the horizontal layering of concrete and the act of corbeling can suggest new strategies for building. The concrete structure, as you can see here, is printed in components that functions as sacrificial zero waste formwork with the main structure. Formwork is printed in small sectional modules to be transported and assembled manually at the remote construction site. 
And in this process, through this project, we develop a hybrid construction system with 3D printed formwork and cast in place concrete with custom rebar. As you can see here um, in the video, each leg is then filled with foam and the void of the legs um, to reduce the amount of concrete that is necessary for casting. Um, and then concrete is poured in between to form the main structure. And here you see going up the assembly of the chimney. The slabs are organized in nine square grid reflecting the interlocking pattern of the legs beneath. In this hybrid building process, tectonic expression is generated by the fabrication method and materiality. Um, for example, as you can see here, the G code and the print path becomes visible as an ornamental pattern of the 3D printed floor slabs. And corbeling is also achieved through sectional transformation that we explore in our earlier projects and becomes an expressive and functional motif here which allows horizontal layers to seamlessly transition from the leg to the slab and then up into the chimney above. The resulting concrete structure lifts off the ground and is characterized by three programmatic areas, a table, a storage seat element, and a seven meter tall fireplace. In the second material system, um, Ashen Cabin is informed by a key environmental crisis of the ash trees in North America. The emerald ash borer is a small beetle whose larvae hatch underneath the tree's bark and cut off vital layers that transport nutrients within its trunk. This beautiful but invasive EAB threatens to eradicate most of the 8.7 billion ash trees in North America and has drastically transformed entire forest ecosystem in the process. As of October, 2018, it is found in 35 states and several Canadian provinces. Mm -hmm. And in 2019, the Emerald Ash Borer also arrived at Cornell officially. So it sort of made its way up. Yeah, into uh, our through, front through door. New York. And so as a reference, um, almost every 10th tree in New York state is an ash tree. So while we as designer cannot help with the dying trees, um, we do believe that infested trees form an enormous and untapped material resource for sustainable wood construction. So due to their geometries, many of these infested ash trees cannot be processed by regular sawmills and are regarded as unsuitable for construction. Challenging preconceived notions about material standards and woods Ashen Cabin utilizes infested trees for its envelope, which unfortunately are widely considered as waste or simply used as firewood. And in this project, uh, to utilize these trees, we developed a process that involves 3D scanning the logs and um, using a custom robotic platform. To transform irregularly shaped waste wood into an abundantly available, affordable, and morbidly sustainable building material for the Anthropocene. Um, with this method, we can slice irregular tree logs into naturally curved boards, and then strategically assemble the boards to form different surface conditions. Ironically, in order to advance environmentally uh, resilient environmental resiliency through architecture, we used uh, resources that themselves were not resilient enough. So by adjusting the thickness of each cut, as you can see here in this diagram, the robotically carved boards can be assembled into single curvature or double curvature surfaces. And, to, and the trees were, were selected based on mostly log diameter and curvature features. And the selection presents a normal cross section of available geometries that fall within the regular parameters of tree growth. And to process and design with the logs, uh, geometric form finding and assembly protocols from form to log and log to form were developed. The custom protocols and scripts enable the design team to easily toggle between design concept, material reality, and fabrication constraints, which then informed the design of the building and vice versa. 
And here in this photograph, you can see how um, the these are some of the slides uh, log boards that follows the natural curvature and that their thickness can also be varied along the cut. Um, to construct you know, a, a building here, like a, an envelope, um, the slide boards are arrayed into interlocking uh, structural insulated uh, panel facade system where solid offcuts can also be structurally integrated into the assembly to result in minimum waste fabrication method. So here in the, in, in the, in the detailed drawing, you can see how um, it's a little bit low res, uh, but there is an exterior layer of curved boards and also an interior layer. And in between is basically um, uh, insulation. So it's a sandwich uh, panel in that sense. The facade assembly is fully ventilated, detailed to manage shrinkage, and does not require an additional rain screen. So before we continue to show the completed project, uh, we just wanted to take a moment and talk about perhaps our own personal crisis of production and automation that we reflect upon frequently when building our own projects. Um, we do usually present ash and Cabin kind of through a front of house narrative, only highlighting the inventions in concrete or timber construction as, as Leslie just did. But we thought it also might be useful in the context of this lecture to include a small visual essay of missed opportunities, shortcuts, compromises, failures, and maybe some of the successes that offer further food for thought and, and discussion within this particular topic. So in the process of translating robotic fabrication methods in practice to a building, the back of house does reveal the inherent massive labor workflows and new complexities. And I think we talked about this uh, throughout the lecture. Um, so these images, I think, serve as a humble reminder of how strangely anachronistic the construction of many buildings still is. In this low structure, shovels, small rental equipment, and robots must work hand in hand, like on many construction sites. And printers and people also work hand in hand in this sort of delicately efficient dance between the machine and its operators, carefully balancing the concrete rheology, print extrusion, and the gravel reinforcement. So, and as we mentioned before, you know, while concrete parts can be mass customized with relative ease, um, the subsequent fabrication of rebar cages incre increases in complexity. This was the case with the Rolling Stones. This was also the case with the cabin. And so, you know, while, while certain parts, parts of this are automated, others aren't, uh, which then requires a substantial amount of time to, to fabricate. Uh, concrete, unfortunately, does not transport itself just yet either, um, and it does not assemble itself on the remote construction site, which was inaccessible for the printer. In the left image, you see the concrete slab that we were referring to that binds all these, these concrete legs together. So as a result, um, ironically enough, supporting formwork must be made for formwork. Um, to enable these cantilevers and other volumetric idiosyncrasies that we were after in this project. The emergence of a design idea, for example, cutting irregular logs with a bandsaw robot is only also one aspect of this entire project. Uh, one of the primary contributions of this project, we think is not fabrication complexity per se, but so fabrication complexity from tree to board to panel but rather an investigation in how to translate fabrication concepts into full-scale buildings from the ground up with all their architectural requirements. And this involves coordinating offsite fabrication sequences and logistics, uh, like in this photo series um, of our uh, warehouse fabrication space, and of course also on-site construction. So Ashen Cabin itself was designed, fabricated, and built in two summers uh, for a total of about six months, so three months and three months, um, again, on a fairly tight budget. And over such short timeframes, ambitions inevitably scale down to meet deadlines um, or other realities. And for example, the SIP panel envelopes that Leslie was talking about had to be deconstructed into a prefabricated exterior skin 
which was then spray formed on site to create the ventilated experimental building envelope. Um, so some of these ideas of modularity had to go due to certain constraints. Uh, but I think at times we found ourselves enjoying this process of negotiation between digital fabrication, detailing, and design across technologies and material systems. So certain disciplinary problems, questions of joinery, material connection, proportion, and performance uh, began to reinfuse our discussions. And they augment the other discussions about the kind of broader crises, environmental, technological, and otherwise. Um, and to us, that was a kind of interesting process. And because Ashen Cabin is a building with many constraints, and not a prototype or a spatial pavilion, it really has to find these kind of awkward compromises between conceptual ambition, material reality, economic reality, and schedule, resulting in this mix of architectural means and construction methods. And so the end result of these constant negotiations is really an unfamiliar hybrid between digital and anachronistic processes of construction. And so returning to Leslie and to the front of house and to summarize the project, we do think that architecturally, Ash and Cabin kind of walks the line between familiar and unfamiliar, between technologically advanced and formally elemental. And so um, transitioning back to the design here, um, in this drawing, it shows the undulating wood surface and how it's strategically deployed to highlight the moments of architectural importance, such as windows, entrances, roofs, drain scuppers, or canopies. And on the inside, we use predominantly straight ash tree sections to create a contrast between the exterior and the interior. So the various windows begin to frame views into the landscape or into the building. And I think most interestingly for us is that no longer bound to the paradigm of timber standardization, you know, such as two by four, this project revisits woodcraft and design based on organic found and living materials. While transformed, the natural tree remains legible in the design. And the cabin in a way combines a variety of fabrication methods material applications, geometries, and types of construction, as you can see in this image, um, where of the ceiling, you know, we use like conventional, um, you know, rafters. And, uh, and then in this photo, you can see the sort of um, coming together of the concrete 3D printing, the, the cut logs, um, the manually made, you know, window frames and so on and so forth. And so we believe that using newly invented forms of making from the ground up at the scale of the building affords unfamiliar and exciting design opportunities. And at various scales, the cabin's performance, structure, and architectural expression are inherently derived from its digital construction protocols, robotic routines, waste materiality, and design logics. At the same time, in a mix of means, the project is inspired by top-down considerations such as precedents, building requirements, program, personal obsessions, and the creative misuse of technology. Together, the various and sometimes conflicting means, robotic, ecological, or otherwise, create the formwork and inform the architectural expression of Ashen Cabin. We hope that this talk conveys some of our work um, is a vehicle to address various urgent uh, disciplinary and interdisciplinary crises, a crisis of access to manufacturing resources, a struggle of manufacturing efficiency and design research, an ecological crisis of materiality and invasive species, and a conceptual crisis to clarify the role and boundaries of design in addressing all these crises. And in our final slide, we would like to emphasize that all our projects are team efforts, and we wholeheartedly thank our amazing and dedicated team. We would also like to thank and acknowledge all our project sponsors and Cornell University for their extraordinary support. And thank you for joining our lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Saint Sasha, for the for the presentation for the lecture. 
Um, that was amazing. Um, okay, so now we'll get into questions. So um, if, if anyone wants to ask a question anonymously, you can type it in the chat, send it to me or any of the members of the committee. Um, and we can ask it for you. Um, or you can use the raise your hand function. Um, and you can then turn on your mic and camera to ask them a question. But I'd like to get started with one question the committee has. Um, there's a conceptual and like the technically formative dialogue between the tool and the material in your projects. Um, how do you juxtapose the position and then the control of the tool with the sort of organic free growth of so-called waste material? Um, I think there, um, there is a feedback loop. Um, so design is not um, a linear process anymore, but rather is really a back and forth. And so in the case of the action cabin, um, you know, we have these kind of initial ideas of how we want to highlight and utilize, you know, these tree forks and so on and so forth. So we would say that's more of a top-down design decision. Um, and then, you know, depending on um, the, the types of logs and forks, uh, like tree parts that we have, that we cut and collected, um, that level of let's say geometry and form and you know, return to inform the overall design adjustment again. And so there's actually a multiple steps of back and forth. And even then, you know, once we have the sort of skin, uh, let's say kind of modeled out, uh, then we are looking at, well, could we actually adjust the varying thickness to um, articulate or de-articulate some curvature? So, so that process was actually quite fun and interesting. Um, and, and I think it took a couple iterations before we get to the end. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, move on. Um, so we have another one um, in the chat. Um, someone asks, what was your approach to design support spaces like wash basin, storage areas, et cetera, for a pristine interior of the ashen cabin? Um, well, I, I think, I think um, it's sort of, a, it's, this is a very interesting question. It's also a very difficult question to ask, uh, to answer, um, not, not to ask, but to answer. So, um, uh, you know, I think one of, one of our struggles, and I, I think this is not something that we have resolved yet. So this question of um, what, what dictates certain decisions um, in, a, in an architectural project. I think it's easier to answer these questions uh, within the context of, of an installation that talks about primarily structural optimization or, or that reduces, um, that is reduced to one or two aspects of an architectural project, right? Um, the Ashen Cabin is a kind of more complex beast in some ways uh, because, because we are very interested in seeing how some of these fabrication uh, techniques translate and might determine how you think of a storage element or, or, or a wash basin and uh, this little kitchen element admittedly kind of looks a little bit like a kind of uh, a bidet. oversized bidet or, or, or a toilet. toilet. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I think there are certainly, there are certainly material and fabrication parameters that um, impact or influence in certain aspects of this project. Uh, but then we, we did find that throughout the, pro the, the process of designing this, um, this project, that we were also interested in exploring certain things uh, that might reference um, um, architectural precedents or that sort of uh, discuss um, uh, function, form, and structure and materiality on a different level that is not only derived from these internal par parameters of fabrication and uh, kind of efficiency. And I think just as an example, the, that, little, that little roof, the little awning um, before you enter the, the, the cabin has nothing to do with the kind of efficiency. It's something that uh, we needed or wanted to have as a, as a performative element. But then we do quite appreciate its awning-like reference. So there's a kind of literal reference of awning. And so those are certain kind of internal architectural jokes that we are, um, that we are deploying in this project. And so 
I, I don't think I can sort of very precisely pinpoint uh, to what dictates certain decisions. And that's certainly a kind of negotiation between various um, factors. Um, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but whoever uh, wants to know more can just uh, write a follow up in the chat and we'll try to clarify. Oh, thank you. Um, there's another question in the chat. Um, a lot of your work is sculptural in nature and applies to things at the scale of a vase um, to a multi story building. Uh, many of these explorations and research appear to look into additive fabrication. Um, I wonder if you've thought about exploring subtractive fabrication of existing materials traditionally associated with sculptures such as marble or metal. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, I think in order to make a, a bit of an impact and to sort of push a fabrication method, one has to sort of stick with it and explore it for a certain amount of years, which is what we did with the concrete. Um, so building the fabrication platform and testing mm -hmm. the materials, building the expertise to build something bigger mm -hmm. uh, takes quite some time. Um, uh, and I think I'm just saying this uh, to, to emphasize that we're, that we're not, um, we're not only obsessed with, with concrete 3D printing uh, or additive uh, manufacturing. I think, in fact, we've used the, the robot, um, for example, in the additive, uh, um, not, not in the additive, in the sub-additive printing uh, process, uh, we are now combining um, methods of fabrication so mm -hmm. that uh, we first print this kind of very messy um, scaffolding, and then we use uh, tooling, uh, CNC tooling, to induce additional precision into this. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it's a very good point that one shouldn't only rely on one construction method or one fabrication method. And um, now we are at a moment where we can sort of add additional complexity. Yeah, and as you can see in, um, uh, I guess, in the case of the Ashen Cabin, right, when we begin to tackle the building at the, um, and it's all in this many constraints, it's um, one has to, the project and the material becomes layered. This is not a singular narrative anymore, but looking at um, how do we create envelope, right? So bring also in installations and so on and so forth and thinking about building systems. And um, so, you know, it would be interesting to incorporate, you know, further other material in the process, but I think our starting point or our design question will always start with, well, how, how does this inform a new or different way of constructing or using standardized material in a non-standardized way? So I think our questions, our design questions are framed kind of larger beyond, you know, not necessarily solely as, you know, with material as the one parameter, but rather, um, um, you know, uh, I guess what's unique to to a particular condition and system there. So um, in the sense of particularly looking at hybrid construction that then, you know, begin to have uh, uh, like exploring new ways of building. We have another one, um, a technical question. Um, what has been your preferred method for digitizing the irregular organic materials for fabrication? Are there processes to refine a scan or improve its accuracy? Um, yeah, I think I think scanning protocols are obviously very important um, for for this for working with the irregular material. So, as Leslie said, it's a kind of back and forth between digital and analog processes or uh, physical reality and a digital reality. We've tested all different types of scanners. In the beginning, uh, we worked with a, a LiDAR scanner from Faro that was a kind of stationary scanner with a really high resolution that sort of can scan up to 200 feet or something like this. Um, and um, we found that process to be, um, while very precise, uh, rather time consuming, because in order to capture a scan, you need multiple uh, scanning points. Um, and that sort of adds up and takes time. So what we're doing right now is, is using um, a simple iPad uh, with, with, a, with a scanning app um, that uh, works both with, with kind of uh, LiDAR and image detection. And as you see, 
uh, as you saw in the video, um, that that uh, that process isn't super precise, um, but uh, it's it's precise enough so that we can understand where the physical workpiece has to be located um, in relation to to the digital workpiece to then um, mm -hmm. start uh, construction or fabrication. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the way it's kind of like figuring out what is close enough as good enough, um, kind of being efficient in the process. All right, thank you, Leland. So, so actually, Virginia Tech is also doing something with that. Maybe someone else in the call can speak more to it, but we're working with some bamboo fabrication techniques. And I think they're doing some scanning and um, I think they're doing their scanning with iPhones, mm -hmm. which is even <laughs> less robust than anything we've talked about. But I think they're still getting some results, but we have some, some types of that scanning to fabrication going on here. It's kind of interesting to see that. Yeah, I think the the process of you know 3D scanning really allows, um, I mean, it provided such sort of expanded freedom in terms of cataloging, but also being able to use non-standardized material, right? Like such as bamboo that has its own sort of idiosyncrasies, and um, and and they and they are increasingly you know much more accessible, which is what's so fantastic about you know some of these tools. All right, um, Aaron, you can ask your question. Uh, yeah, good evening. Nice to see you. Um, I, um, I want to try and take it out of the technical sphere uh, for a second. <clears throat> Although technically, of course, it's very interesting what you're doing. But what um, occurred to me was that for all of the machine driven um, direction of the work, the results often seem to approach a kind of deformed or abstracted form of vernacular. Um, and that's true not only in the cabin, but also in the housing project in China. Uh, and you could even say it was true of the, the knot. There's a sense that by investigating the work and applying uh, a system, the, sorry, the material <clears throat> and applying a, uh, um, a machine logic to it, you unearth a kind of, or reiterate a kind of vernacular. Um, and I was just hoping that you could uh, talk a little bit about whether or not you're surprised by the familiarity of the imagery and the forms, uh, whether that is something actually in the back of your mind. I, I can theorize about why it is, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, thank you, thank you, Aaron, for for this question. Um, and uh, I, I would I would say that this is in in the back of our mind, and this is also something that, that comes up uh, frequently in in conversations and, and discussions. And I think you're, I mean, you're right in your analysis that uh, to a certain certain extent we're explicit about uh, technological parameters and uh, parameters of fabrication and construction. We're perhaps a bit less explicit about the other references that that our work uh, sort of relates to. Um, you know, there's the kind of Corbusian gutter and drainage spout, and, and so so these other things that sort of make its way in. I think that maybe has something to do with the with to some extent the the context that we're working in or the the materials that we're using, but also the the our our own sort of personal. Um, Passions. I think the, the question of of the vernacular um, is is particularly um, interesting um, in a sense that uh, it seems like uh, with with the with the vernacular architecture, there is often a kind of idea of um, uh, let's say there's a kind of rationalization that goes on uh, um, that that uh, I personally quite enjoy. There's a certain sort of efficiency and pragmatism, perhaps, uh, that, that sort of occurs. There's a simplicity to both form and construction. And, um, and uh, I think 
I think while, while we're not explicitly referencing certain vernacular types, uh, I think that's what we share and maybe have in common, um, mm -hmm. the sort of notion of, uh, of, of trying to read the material and then transforming mm -hmm. it in the simplest way possible, perhaps. Yeah, and I, I think also in our process, um, I think with all the projects and tools that we've used, um, we intentionally, I guess, in a way, the goal was not to optimize. It was not to um, find the most efficient form. Um, so when we take the importance or the goal of optimization out of the digital process or the computational, the parametric process, um, in the way we bias and privilege maybe, um, then you know, what other possible narratives or expression can it be derived of if, it, if it's not about optimization? So is it about like what, um, you know, how do we express and utilize the wood differently or how do we like, you know, really be obsessive about the layering of the concrete, like turn that into a tectonic expression. And, and so I think we were, were much more interested in the sort of design exploration, tectonic articulation, and that has been the driving goals in all these design explorations in that sense. And the tools, um, of course, very much inform uh, that help produce and discover uh, these expressions. And I think uh, maybe just to, just to add to this, I think this is also, where maybe we draw the line between the research lab and practice. Uh, and so the research lab um, oftentimes uh, explores kind of uh, fundamentals of, of building construction and prototypes and, and maybe pavilions, whereas the practice then takes some of these methods um, and, and, apl and applies them, um, but, but not in the kind of stringent, uh, optimized uh, way necessarily. So, we're, we are, I think, in our practice, interested in the misuse of technology and the sort of slight, slight slippages that occur uh, between narratives. Yeah, there's also a kind of romanticism about uh, both technology and natural materials or materials as they are, you know, what the material wants to be. That seemed to be merging, not just in your work, but <clears throat> in a group of people who are interested in uh, the exploration of natural materials through the latest computer technology. So I'm just intrigued to see a new version of the vernacular, which is of course, not just what is, but is a systematization of locally available materials and conditions um, with this goal of creating this idealized version of a reality in which human beings and nature come together exactly through uh, the most sophisticated tools that are available to you at the time. And it seems uh, as if there's a, a kind of group of people, including you, that are now pursuing that kind of new machinic vernacular that uh, I can't wait to see as it, as it scales up and develops. Well, we can't wait either. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's lots of patience required. Yeah, it's especially with building, it takes time. Thank you. <laughs> um, Emma, do you wanna ask uh, your question? Um, sure. I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between these natural, sometimes unusable products like the emerald ash borer infested wood um, with man-made products like concrete and specifically how they might affect or inform each other in projects where they exist together. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it, was, uh, it was very important for us in the Ashen Cabin actually to explore um, a more complex material system. I think this could have easily been a project that um, looks at only 3D printing and, and sort of tries to, to print everything with, with a mono material system. But we, we, we specifically made the choice um, to, to look at the combination of materials because we do think that uh, that's, that's part of the complexity, I would say, of, of a building or an architectural project. Um, and I, we think that there are some opportunities uh, to this. And so I think there are sort of small choices that we made, right? That, that sort of impact 
how we organize materials. For example, the concrete, um, all, all the layers are horizontal and are very small and fine. And it's all about this kind of corbeling. And then at the, at the scale, at the, at the floor plate, it's about the making of patterns. And the project sort of tries to express that as best as it can uh, in, in these corbelled legs and in the corbeling that goes on in the chimney and, and on all the other elements. Um, whereas the, the, the wood, we deliberately uh, arranged horizontally. It's sort of a, maybe a kind of slight reference to a, a board and batten construction or something like that um, uh, to then also allow it to, to shed the water in different ways. And so there is a kind of interplay between these materials that occurs through assembly and organization. Um, and um, I think, I think that, that, that happens at sort of uh, the, the architectural scales. Of course, there are also sort of uh, technical differences between the two materials. And as Leslie has pointed out before, it's kind of an interesting design process when you work with this natural material, because you might have a kind of, you might have an, uh, you have a, perhaps an image or an idea in mind of what kind of tree you might want. Um, but then you go into the forest and you, I mean, we, we literally went into the forest and selected trees and we tried to find something that is sort of roughly what we had designed for. But then there's an additional step required when working with the natural material that has to translate your inventory back into the design. So it's, it's, it's not like, you're, you, you can't rely on going to uh, Home Depot and buying your standard tree fork. And so it's a kind of interesting, different process that occurs specifically when working with the natural material. Yeah, and I would add that, you know, with both, it, it provides, they, they, they each provide their own, let's say, design freedom and constraints, right? You know, with 3D printing concrete, you could almost print any form. Uh, you know, depending on how, you know, the sort of severity of the, the cantilever and so on and so forth. So uh, gravity and sort of material cure time is the constraint, you know, working with concrete. And with wood in this case, then it's either the type of forks or tree geometry logs that we could source, right? So, um, so it's, it's actually quite interesting, um, you know, juggling or negotiating between different sets of type of constraints that one has to deal with when working with the two systems. Um, and, and so, and they also have very different weight, you know, when we, when we finished the concrete part first and then moving to the second part, we were like, oh, we're gonna use law, we're gonna use wood. It's going to be so much lighter. <laughs> Life will be so much easier. Uh, yes and no, because logs are still very, very heavy. And, you know, so, uh, you know, engaging with that, um, there, there's a whole host of kind of interesting um, kind of challenges and opportunities with, with, with the two systems. Um, there's a question in the chat regarding um, printing in place and if you always have to print in place and then also about the heaviness of the concrete structures and moving them to the site. I know you briefly mentioned that, um, or you didn't briefly, but you mentioned that in the presentation. Um, could you, could you elaborate further on specifically how you move those structures to the site, um, how many people it would take, um, just like the practicality behind um, printing in place and then moving um, to the site? Um, yeah, so we're, we're actually currently working on um, a residential project in, in Houston where we would print on site. So we're bring the printer on site and then printing directly there, you know, from thinking about from foundation structure and up and so on and so forth. Um, and so that would be kind of the ideal scenario, which we'll be testing out this year. Um, and with the, with the cabin, it's, um, it's really just muscle strength, <laughs> manual lifting, lots of sweat. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, we could have print each of those legs and pot in one go. Um, but um, due to the weight and knowing that we have to um, carry them manually, that we decided to print them in section. And that also helps with transportation. And this is where logistics comes into place, where um, then the smaller pieces can be nested in a bigger pieces so they can be nested while they're being transported. Um, so basically, we printed them and then nest them in the back of a you know U-Haul truck and then drove them onto site and then 
manually, you know, then weld them over to 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 site. So, um, so it was a laborious process in that sense. But that also reduced a lot of the concrete mixing that one would have to done on site. Otherwise, yeah. All right, uh, we have another one. Your work so far heavily emphasizes the role of technology in creating a space. There's an intimate relationship between the craftsman and the building, but do you foresee work that relates the technology to the enrichment of the inhabitant? Um, yeah, um, I mean, in, in these projects, right, I would be we would say most of the tools are still, you know, require someone with quite a lot of knowledge, you know, to, to actually apply and work with it. And so um, in our research currently, we're looking at, um, we're working on actually engaging with AR augmented reality, right? Um, that will allow, let's say, the, the deployment of customized parts and customized um, material working with non-standard material without um, the infrastructure of, you know, top-down heavy machinery and so on and so forth. And so we are currently exploring how we could keep investigating and finding ways of using non-standard material in a different way um, and introducing complexity to them uh, on site um, that would allow, um, that would make it more accessible for local community, um, local trade unions, um, and, and deploying some of these methods. We don't have the work to show yet, but it's a work in progress. Elin, you wanna ask yours? Yeah. So you've talked about the relationships you have to practice and research and as professors, I'm wondering how you connect the maybe the third branch of teaching into that and where that falls in relation to the practice and research, maybe in terms of um, looking at the design build aspects that seems like you offer students opportunities to help with your projects. So talking about the, the relationships of that and how you engage students. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's also a great question um, uh, because yes, we we are uh, in fact uh, teachers uh, as well as practitioners and, and researchers, um, and I think uh, some some of the work that we showed today is sort of a direct result of of teaching essentially, um, especially the the studios are. are the tools, the tools were developed, uh, both the printer and the robot uh, were developed in option studios as a kind of collaborative research enterprise, where maybe a third of the semester was spent to set up the tool. And then the, the other two thirds of the semester were then explored to use the tool and to apply it to architectural concepts. And so we do that in option studios, uh, but we also do this in, in seminars, for example. Um, and so there is a there is a pretty healthy, I would say, back and forth between teaching and research, uh, at least. And obviously, these ideas uh, influence practice and, and, and vice, vice versa. Um, and then, uh, as you pointed out, there is also, um, I, mean, I think we, we uh, most of the projects that you see here, the design build projects uh, were uh, constructed within the context of the Cornell community. So um, students then get, get hired for, for research projects over the summer and we assemble teams and, and work on this for like three months uh, to sort of achieve a goal. And so while this is not part of our class, um, it's certainly part of the broader community. Um, and, and we are generally interested in and, and also thinking about sort of scaling things up um, in the studio context and um, um, maybe uh, doing sort of design build project. What's often challenging there is the timeline of a semester. A mm -hmm. uh, semester is rather short and then to design, innovate, research and build is often times difficult. And yeah. so I think one would need to find uh, formats where either it's a kind of two semester project or uh, it's, it's a spring semester plus a summer project or something like that. 
Yeah, and um, it sometimes I think the teaching context also, um, you know, informs its constraints inform, you know, some ex some particular types of exploration. For example, with the printer when it was first built in Sasha's studio, um, the material that was used, even though we would like to explore concrete, right? Um, the you know that might not be the best material to test um, in a short semester. And so um, the studio end up using a two part biofoam because you know foam cures fast. You can print and it cures fast, and you know that can be built rapidly. Um, and and so um, it's also kind of the setup is in a way is also lighter to maneuver and play around with. And so you know in the context of the studio, then foam became. Um, spray foam became a much more ideal as a material to explore than concrete in that sense. Um, I'm just going to cut in Matias, uh, their Wi-Fi just cut out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're, maybe they'll get back on. Um, is anyone, I guess, who else the hosting? Uh, they said they're reconnecting right now. Just... It's okay. We're not afraid of awkward silence. <laughs> <laughs> Very good at this. Maybe I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question in the meantime. Um, I think that the question earlier about uh, human beings was not necessarily about collaborators or constructors, but uh, if the process of designing a piece of architecture is wholly technology driven. What is the relationship between that and the social relations, the um, desires and fears uh, and needs of belonging of the inhabitant users, viewers, uh, those people who uh, have to confront the finished object? I mean, this, this is a kind of, uh, uh, I think the way it was phrased in the question uh, was a kind of particular terminology talking about the enrichment of the in mm -hmm. inhabitant, yeah. which is, I think, an interesting term uh, if, one, if one dissects it. And uh, I mean, I think interestingly enough, we can sort of- That's, that's why we were trying to find <laughs> we can language. We can report, uh, I mean, uh, strangely or funnily enough, we are the inhabitants of the Ashen Cabin. Um, so this is a kind of personal <laughs> project for, for us. And uh, I mean, there are, there are certain um, enrichments, I would say, or, or pleasures that come from, from, from the project itself and, and the space and, and the use of it. And um, uh, so I, I think, um, I mean, in, in some ways, I would I would argue that it's it's a mischaracterization to look at the Ashen Cabin as a, a purely technology driven project. I think it's really not. Um, and in fact, if you ask a technologist, they would be offended by so many of the things that we do. So, so um, I, I don't I don't really know where that sort of leaves us. But I would I would sort of caution about the kind of classification uh, that that is kind of implied uh, in, mm -hmm. in the question. Um, and then uh, you know we do think that it's really important to acknowledge uh, some of the powers of architecture and some of the pleasures of architecture. And while this project doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, because it's a kind of small, a little exclusive cabin somewhere in, in the wild, it doesn't necessarily uh, address uh, any, any issues uh, uh, or urban social economic issues or something like that. Um, it, it, does, it does engage in a discourse with ecology and, and environment at a, at a certain mm -hmm. level. I think one, one derives a certain pleasure from that, knowing that uh, out of the 100,000 trees at Cornell that are currently dying from the emerald ash borer, at least those 10 have a different purpose now, right? The 10 that we cut down and processed uh, with, with this hard labor. Um, and so I think, I think those notions uh, are very much present uh, when, mm -hmm. when we visit the project. And um, maybe to expand on that a little bit in terms of thinking through, let's say, larger scales as well is, I think a lot has to do with how the tools also provide agency, just as the tool have provide design agency to us. Um, you know, the tools have potential to 
provide also user agency in customizing, customization for, you know, particular group of users in, in the future. Um, it's, the, it's not so much discussed here, but, you know, um, and I actually also relating back to uh, the question about teaching. Um, so uh, one of the studios that, you know, we taught was looking at uh, how do we use some of these tools um, in a rural low tech context to provide customization opportunity for let's say rural residents and housing. Um, and, and so, um, so kind of bringing back the agency, not to the, not to the top down builder or developer, but uh, uh, introducing some of that level of decision making, whether it is like the local material or the users themselves um, to, to kind of customize or build, um, let's say, living space or domestic space um, in the context of housing. And, and so, you know, of course, you know, it takes it does take time to actually fully test out and realize some of these ideas. Um, and so uh, we hope some, some point in the near future in the next couple of years, we have, we would be able to share some of those work that we're currently working on in that respect. And we have one final question to wrap up this amazing lecture and Q and A. Um, where do you see the future of building technology or building construction in terms of the additive processes or subtractive processes or a mix of both? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I think as we as we pointed out uh, before, there is a transformation that is occurring um, in, in the building industry, in the construction industry, and um, these processes are ongoing. And we do think that it's, it's important that we as architects have a certain agency in these processes or help develop them. Uh, and um, there are obviously there, uh, we think that there are disadvantages, that there are advantages to these, to using these processes, but there are also disadvantages, uh, like um, sort of changing models of, of labor, for example, just sort of being, being one. And um, so I think in regards to additive processes, uh, we've seen an enormous uh, change in the last five years. Um, I mean, a lot of these techniques or technologies are now ready for implementation. And as Leslie mentioned, uh, we're working on this right now with building industry partners. And unfortunately, we can't really talk about that project just yet, but uh, um, I hope down the road uh, we can. And so there's, there's really massive, massive movement. Now, but what we think is really important is to not only look at the technological side of this, um, but to think about this more broadly in terms of what this means, maybe for practice and, and what it might mean to either use or misuse some of these technologies, because I think one has to be careful not to buy into everything. I mean, there's a lot of sort of promise uh, or false promise with these technologies. And um, um, you know, while we're excited about them, we also look at them skeptically. Um, yeah, and with the with the let's say wider um, implementation and also access to these process, um, you know, there are you know very important let's say systems and elements to deal with, namely you know building codes. Um, uh, you know, for 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 a building to be permitted, right? And so. Um, uh, also, instead of thinking about, um, let's say, additive process as, as a kind of mono system, um, thinking about what are some of the ways that it could be coupled or could be hybridized with also other convention system um, to make it, let's say, more um, accessible, but um, uh, not only, you know, one part is through the permitting process, um, but also, you know, being smart about what it's good for and not try to force, you know, uh, let's say, you know, these tools into doing everything, right? Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of the times more existing uh, conventional methods are, are already very efficient and smart. Um, but it's more about the, the pairing or the hybridizing um, of these tools and technology. How can how can it augment and I guess use the word enrich again? You know the design, right, or its complexity and expression. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Sasha and Leslie, for for your time, um, for the presentation, for the work. 
um, in your answers. Um, I know we all really enjoyed it. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to seeing uh, <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank it's, you very much. It's very nice at times like this to be able to connect with um, other communities. Um, so yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your questions. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Good work, team. Good work, team.